Great. All right, thank you, Jessica. So uh, hello and welcome everybody to our webinar today. Uh, the webinar is the next evolution of open source and the future of data. Um, this is a little bit different than what we usually do. Typically you see a lot of slides and people talking. We're gonna do something a little different and, and have, a, have an interview here. Of course, uh, there's no slides, but uh, the recording will be available else, you know, after the sessions for everybody uh, to review. And we'll, we'll send a link uh, afterwards. So. Um, so let's just get into it. Uh, I guess we can go live with the with the video, Jess. If you we're live, okay. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Jim Walker. I'm VP of Product Marketing here at Cockroach Labs. I'm joined by Spencer Kimball. I'm one of the co-founders of Cockroach Labs and uh, the CEO. Yeah. So I guess in our between two ferns, I'm I Zach Galifianakis, <laughs> and uh, you're the guest. I guess is that is that how it's going to work? So, I think so. cool. Um, so we have a we have a good set of topics to talk about. I wanted to start with a little bit of background on Spencer, but we're going to talk about open source um, uh, to a good amount as well. It's one of our favorite topics to talk about, and then we're going to talk a little bit about uh, you know databases and cloud and what we see twenty twenty five and beyond starting to look at. So just to get things started, to give a little uh, background, uh, you, Peter, Ben, the three founders, were all at Google, right? Early days. What, what year did you join Google? Oh, it was year four for Google. Year so four. It's arguable whether it was still really much of a startup then, but uh, we were there for the better part of a decade. Right. From 2002 to 2012 and uh, worked on a variety of projects. Actually, one way I like to think of it is we kind of seesawed between building applications that used infrastructure. Right. And then moving over and building infrastructure to enable the next generation of applications and that uh, that process uh, went uh, repeated itself a couple of times. I think I've been using something you built for like 20 years. Uh, I, 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 I was I've originally, been at Google I, then. <laughs> I, well, I used GIMP. So I think you and Peter built out GIMP too, right? That's so right. if people aren't familiar with that, it's a, it was a graphical photo manipulation tool. It was like it is, everywhere. It is, it is, it is, it is. It's still available. <laughs> yeah, which is amazing because we stopped working on it in 1997. <laughs> So it's, uh, it's the power of open source. It's that thing still was, going strong. But I think the back end, a lot of the stuff that you worked on at Google as well, even early days, all the way through your whole career there. Um, what, did, what did you work on while you were at Google? Ooh, you uh, and Peter were together a lot of that time, right? There was definitely significant overlap. Well, we did diverge in some, some cases, the same with Ben. Ben and I got started together actually on the AdWords project. Right. And we built all kinds of things. We wrote uh, the Google servlet engine, which was a replacement for Tomcat that kind of looked more like Google, the way Google liked to run applications in production. We worked on a, an ORM for Google. We worked on their database sharding issues, right. <laughs> which were, was a bit of a, a war room for several months of trying to make, uh, make that thing scale appropriately. Um, and then I moved over more into the straight infrastructure side started working on distributed file storage. Mm -hmm. And that ended with about five years spent on a system called Colossus. Yep. Peter worked with me on that directly. Ben worked on Google Reader. So he kind of went the application route at that point. Pete worked on some computer vision stuff at some point. So we kind of all over the map, but we got a, a nice sampling for uh, both the kinds of um, opportunities in terms of what kind of applications you could build and the challenges, which often, in Google's case at least, were an opportunity to really invest in R&D and solve a problem in a new way using the, um, you know, the fairly unique at the time uh, combination of users everywhere around the world right. uh, and in incredible ability to distribute a new application to those users because of the power of Google's platform, um, but also Google's uh, incredible investment in their sort of private cloud infrastructure, which of course has been extended into GCP in right. the modern era. But uh, that was in the aughts, uh, quite an uh, incredible thing to have uh, as your reality, a data center in you know, every region, um, in many cases, multiple data centers. What kind of new infrastructure could you build when that was your reality? And right. the answer was quite a bit. Google was willing to invest in it. Right, I always joke that, you know, Google builds new things because they can hire a bunch of really great engineers. Uh, it's like, yeah, why did they have to rebuild Tomcat? Well, it is, <laughs> it's not because they had to hire, it's because they actually had a different vision of what this stuff was, right? And so, you know, what were the, some of the things that were behind, you know, Colossus and the build out of a file system, you know, that, that had to scale globally? That was important, you know, early days at, at Google. There are a couple of things, but it all has had to do with scale. Yeah. And uh, previously, the, the Google's first attempt at this was something called GFS, Google File That's System. Right. And Colossus was the successor. And the, the, the reason for Colossus, the reasons, there were two big ones. 
one was they needed to make clusters that were 10 times larger or even maybe 100 times larger than the biggest they could do with the architecture that uh, GFS was built with. It's kind of like these architectures, they, they do really well for a certain number of years and then they start to get a little bit long in the tooth. Right. Um, Google's solution wasn't to keep trying to <clears throat> upgrade the same one with all the legacy code paths and all of the bells and whistles and things that had evolved over the years. Their solution was, you know what, we're going to redesign this from scratch with something that doesn't have any of the bells and right. whistles. We're going to do it for just a single use case. And then we're going to expand it a little bit to get the next use case. And then we expand a little bit more and hopefully get the next four use cases, and then a little bit more and get the next 20 use cases. Right. And then they'd eventually move everyone over and then they sunset GFS. And that took years to happen, but it's mostly about scale. And then the other big thing, which comes with scale, is how do you save money? Right. Because Google was shoveling uh, truckfuls of cash and continue to, of course. And the question is, can you can you shovel uh, <laughs> half truckfuls of cash? And the answer is yes. Interestingly, with distributed file storage, there was some um, things that Google definitely didn't invent, but were well known called Reed Solomon codes that uh, would decrease the amount of replication necessary in order to store data with the same level of uh, the same guarantees around availability right and it's just really interesting trade-offs in the space but that was one of the big things that was different about colossus it cut the the effective cost of storage from 3x down to about 1.666 repeating right yeah i mean fast forward today and a lot of what they learned um early days right and and kind of you being on the front lines of that is a lot of stuff that's being applied today and i think the the move to the cloud is because of this the reduction in operating expense right like in you have to go through these efficiencies Absolutely. to actually make that happen. I mean, you know, they, you talk about how they, they invented tools where they iterated on tools as well to, to kind of accomplish things. You know, they also had big table. Um, uh, and I think that's now like consumer grade, right? Like we, we see people use that all the time. Um, it's fantastic. Right. What about from a relational data point of view? I think you were there kind of watching what happened as well. And then after Google as well, you, you, you witnessed some of this, right? Yeah, uh, you know, when I started Google, as I mentioned, I was on the AdWords project and the AdWords had opted to use MySQL and the first version I'm sure ran on one AdWords, uh, right. one MySQL database. <laughs> and then that started getting too large. And so they said, okay, we're going to shard and we'll put some customers on shard one and some on shard two. And the application will know based on the customer ID, which of those databases to talk to. Then it went to four shards and then it went to eight shards. That's where things started really running into all kinds of technical right. problems. And uh, eventually that system, long after I had stopped working on it, had gone to a thousand shards. But long before that happened, and it did get replaced at that point with Spanner, but long before uh, that happened, the sharding of uh, MySQL at the application layer uh, became, I'd say, an anti-pattern within Google. Yeah. So it was, I wouldn't say outlawed because other things did you know, um, follow suit especially in the acquisitions that Google made over the years. Um, but Google decided this is a, uh, a solution that we don't want to embrace. We don't want this to be ubiquitous at Google. And instead, how do we build new kinds of databases? And uh, you mentioned relational. I think in the early days, Google decided that you know relational just was too difficult to do and also accomplish what they wanted to accomplish or maybe needed to accomplish right, yeah. in terms of just massive scalability of the systems. Yeah. So Bigtable was the first real uh, read write style database. What year was Bigtable? That was it came out, in, well, it was the paper was in 2004, yeah. I believe. Um, but of course it was under development quite a bit earlier than yeah. that, made it into production earlier than that. Uh, you know, Bigtable was, you know, I think pe most people would cited as being the advent of NoSQL. It really and, is. And yeah. I think the really important thing to realize, at least from Google's perspective, is NoSQL wasn't created because people didn't like SQL necessarily. It was created because SQL and elastic scalability were uh, too much to implement yeah. together. And so you got to choose one or the other. SQL wasn't, you know, many of those use cases that Bigtable uh, was initially applied towards, you know, they had simplifying assumptions. Right. But we don't really need to have transactions and we certainly don't need this uh, relational querying capability so we can simplify those things get the scale and the uh, replication and so forth that we're looking for um, but interestingly uh, this isn't i don't think so widely known 
it only took about two years for Google to realize internally that they didn't want to build applications directly on the big table, or at least not general purpose applications. It's interesting. They, they yeah. decided there wasn't enough transactionality in big table. They introduced something called Megastore, which only took about two years. I remember there was like a kind of a push when big table came out because it was really cool and it won the camera over which where the paper was submitted, but it was, it was a big deal just like GFS right. was before it because it was so innovative. Uh, and there was a push to do more at Google on Bigtable, um, and including towards the AdWords team that had been using MySQL. And you know, by then, the AdWords schema is probably 150 tables, and obviously needed to be transactional. I'm still like I'm still stuck with you saying that AdWords was on a single shard of MySQL. Oh, one day it was. <laughs> you know, like, it was <laughs> when like, there was one user. It's just it. awesome, right? <laughs> yeah. Like, I'm sorry, but yeah, yeah, it got quite a bit bigger. Yeah, exactly. But, yeah, I mean the. the uh, the the response for the MySQL, you know, uh, teams or at least the AdWords team yeah, exactly. MySQL was big table is great, super cool, but there's no way we can move this model to it. It doesn't have transactions, it doesn't right. have a notion of these schemes, everything's really hand rolled. And that's it's you know, we could we could potentially do it, but the amount of work necessary is just it's not it's not uh, it's not an appropriate solution. So that led not for AdWords directly, but for other kinds of projects that were right. you know, increasingly cropping up at Google towards um, new architectures and um, new capabilities added to the big table ideas. Right. And that's where Megastore came from. And then only several years or maybe just a, one year after Megastore really um, kind of hit production, that's when the planning for Spanner started. Right. Cool. So I, I want to go back to something that you said. It was actually kind of interesting and, and, and it actually works really well with this transition of Google from early days, MySQL all the way through to kind of fully distributed SQL with, with, with Spanner. That took years. Yes. It took years for them to go through that. I think, I, I don't know, I'm, I've, I'm enjoying watching what Kubernetes is doing to a lot of these organizations today. And like, I think they're, you know, I feel like we're really going through this kind of radical paradigm shift. Like there's this massive transformation that's happening within all of IT. I think there's lessons to be learned about, you know, like this, this paradigm shift, like Google went through. I mean, you, you know, I know Brandon Phillips, the one of the founders of CoreOS used to say Giphy, that was one of his big things, like Google infrastructure for everybody, which actually fast forward, it's kind of happening, right? Mm -hmm. But, but how, it, how much after the fact, I mean, it's important it, to keep in mind that it was definitely Borg, which is the Google homegrown predecessor to Kubernetes was at a level of fairly advanced sophistication by 2005. Yeah. Um, and Kubernetes, I, I, I still don't believe, I mean, in some respects, I'm sure, but overall isn't quite at the level of sophistication that Borg had that early. Right. So it's, it, it, it's, it's incredible the, the, the interval of time before Kubernetes is becoming as widespread as it is um, to when its predecessor, which was in many ways yeah. more capable than it even today in 2020, uh, was, you know, uh, fully fleshed out yeah. back in 2005, 2006. Is, is that just the maturity of the tech or is it maturity of the company, Spencer, right? Like, cause I think, you know, if I look at Google, Google is able to hire 10,000 people to go the last mile. Um, and I think we're trying to apply something that's very general purpose to a very broad, you know, set of customers with various different needs. I mean, every, you know, every company is very different as you know, right? Like, do you, do you consider that to be the issue or is it just that, you know, Kubernetes is a different, you know, code base. I think you, you bring up a really good point, and it's a it's a unbelievable double edged sword at Google. Right? right. Yes, they have a tremendously uh, you know pedigreed set of engineers at Google, and the bar to work there is quite high. And you expect those kinds of engineers to be the ones that can read the source code and figure things out sure. for themselves where they run into a problem, and they do. Right. Believe me. Uh, like an engineer not related to something like Borg would go in there and, and modify it and send out a, a, a pull request all the time. Right. Uh, and that was, you know, what you would expect from your customers. And so Borg, of course, uh, you know, grew and evolved very quickly in that sort of an environment. And yeah. uh, so that's the that's the nice sort of cutting edge of the sword uh, that, that cuts away from you uh, right. at, at, at Google. Um, where where it actually ends up cutting them is that. They often then take those solutions, try to polish them, put them into their cloud, and then leave much of the broader public ecosystem uh, with a solution that there's a big impedance mismatch, right? Either it's too complex, it has non-standard APIs, and Google's unaware of this, and they, and they it's, you know, 
progressively seem to get better as they yeah. iterate and put things into the cloud. But it is their it's their blessing and their curse that uh, that that the customers for all of this infrastructure <laughs> and the first iterations are internal to Google, and then when they try to go external, yeah. there's a big bridge to cross. I've joked about this for years. It's like when I first started using Google Slides. I'm a marketer now. I don't code anymore, right? But like. <laughs> it took me forever to actually like Google my mind or something. Cause like I had to think differently. Right. And like all their products are really good. And it's like that last 10%, you kind of got to manually start to do things. And I think that that's kind of been one of these things. I think that's happening with Kubernetes, but I think Kubernetes also has a very rich and, and, and complete and uh, activated, that's for sure. Open source community built around it. Right. And so let, let's just shift a little bit. I, one of my favorite topics to talk to you about is open source. Um, yeah, I think open source is a, it's a hot topic these days, right? What, what do you think is, why, why is that, right? Like, I think, I, I won't, I won't see it. I'll just, I'll just, I'll leave it as open as that. And we can kind of see where we go, but why, why is you're asking me these questions? Know, Cause I, I feel like you know more about open source. No, I don't. Anything. I just love it. You know, I love it. So you know, it's, you, it's a great topic, right? It so, is a great topic and people yeah. are, are very interested in, in it for in, in good reasons. Yeah. And I think the, the, the biggest one is just, the, the consumption model. And I think that's what r just rocketed open source into uh, the dominant software paradigm. Right. And the, the reason is, you know, I, it, there's some open source, there's a strain of open source thought that's, you know, very principled and idealistic, you know, to, exemplified by someone like Richard Stallman and the, right. and the yeah. GNU projects. Um, you know, and I'm sympathetic to that, but I think what really launched open source into the mainstream was the fact that Pre previous to open source, a developer wanting to use software had to go through procurement, right. right? Which is an incredibly painful process. You have to get a uh, budget. You have to work with the sales folks from whatever the, the vendor is. The information about that software was difficult um, at best, you know, uh, to, you might have to read a review in a, in a particular journal or something like that. In order to and even if you didn't go through procurement, it wasn't approved, right? Like the early days of Linux, people would try to use okay. it. It was like, no, you couldn't put that into production. Like it was uh, to safeguard the company, right? And so the procurement Absolutely. was there to like safeguard them, but still. But still, and you know, the knowledge of how to use the software that was closed source was often limited to a set of printed stacked up manuals, you know, if, right. lucky, yeah, yeah. if there was even that much information, you couldn't consult the source, of course, so getting started with it was a very slow process. So if you just think about what's the time to value from when you conceive of an idea to when you can get the proper, uh, you know, infrastructure or tools or libraries or whatever you needed to right. build it. And the answer is that that was, you know, necessarily going to take months in the closed source world. Uh, now with open source, uh, developers can just download something, play around with it for you know matter of days, uh, get it running, start to yeah. integrate with it, test with it, and so forth. Uh, and the cost of that was uh, very low, from you know partly supported by the community, which was different. All of a sudden, you could look online and get answers from yeah. a whole bunch of other people. Um, the cost in terms of uh, you know what kind of outlay or budget was necessary went to zero, which is unbelievably right. incredible. And it's just that time was compressed because right. you just didn't have to go through this lengthy process. And so you could actually stand something up as a, as a startup or as a small team within a much bigger company um, overnight. Yeah. And that was the catalyst for business value. And that's why, you know, open source moved out of the sort of academic, uh, you know, Unix focused environment into like truly the dominant yeah. paradigm. Yeah. And I've seen it. I've seen this consumption thing go through various different iterations as well. Like to me, the beauty of open source has always been consumption. Like, but you know what I didn't like to do was download binaries and compile them and deal with make files. And I just, I, I hated it. The, the, the fact that I could actually package these things up into a VM and then just have a VM, like that was a massive, huge leap forward. Right. And I remember, you know, 2009, that's the way we were distributing then open source packages, right? Because you would be actually, you didn't have to actually go into it. You still had code, you still had a community of people, but but that changed. I, I think the consumption model has continued to change, right? Yes. And so um, I think with the advent of software as a service, there's, there's a massive, huge transformation as well, right? Yeah, uh, that's, a, that's a good point you made. I hadn't really thought about that, but you're right. That was definitely an intermediate stepping stone in all of the yeah. pre-built packages and binaries and so forth that you could simply download and that were vetted and tested uh, by 
the community. That, right. that was a great stepping stone. But you're right, things have changed again and they've changed dramatically because just like the change from having to go through procurement to being able to simply download almost instantly from online and use, this time to value is further compressed dramatically. Right. Um, and it's not just, you know, how long does it take me to, as a developer, start to use this and integrate with it if it's, if it's a service that's being provided, say, in AWS. Uh, it's much more about day two operations, right? right? And what's going to happen when we actually launch? Do we have to understand how to monitor this? What are the failure characteristics of, of this particular piece of open source software in our right. stack? And now you can use something like RDS and AWS, and now you can have a MySQL or a Postgres database, and you don't have to do anything with it except for program yeah. towards it. And that is a another fundamental step forward. And you can see uh, how it's affecting a lot of the commercial models that have been built around open source, it's making an end run around them because if something can be offered as a service uh, you know, on a platform, and we're seeing this with uh, Amazon AWS, yeah. it's, a, it's a very good way to uh, essentially win the market, to yeah. get every developer out there or operator to use your service yeah, and I think that's that's what's hot in open source these days. I mean, like it's it's been the last couple of years in terms of what's happening with open source projects as they kind of butt up against these large public cloud providers and being able to distribute things as a service. It's just like I, I always think of open source as like there's the four things, right? There's code. I can still check out the code. There's community, and I think a good open source company builds a community around them. But then also by giving your code to the community, you show people how to actually do things. Like it's really intelligent stuff in there. Uh, is this consumption thing is where it gets really interesting, but we're, we're like overlapped with cost. I, I like, I like alliteration. So, you know, me dude. So, so the, the business license and the, and the licensing around open sources, I think where people have had a lot of, you know, discussion recently yeah, over the last year, um, you know, we went through our, our license change, uh, was about, and time flies eight months, right. Something like this. What was our thinking and, and what was the thinking that we went through as a team here internally? Um, to shift to the VSL license and what is the VSL license? <laughs> a lot of questions there. I know, I know. Well, so, you know, we do believe strongly in open source, but when we started Cockroach, it's always been a, a commercial enterprise and we wouldn't be able to build the database we built if we uh, hadn't been able to get the invest investment. So right. it's a very big project to build this kind of, uh, <clears throat> piece of infrastructure software. So, What's happened over the last year in particular, but certainly it's been evolving for the last three or four, is this very nascent open core model that yeah. was pioneered by, um, see, was, I think MySQL, did they have enterprise features? It might yeah. go that far back, but um, certainly companies like that are more recent, like Elastic is a great example of a company that, that did a good job with an open core model. Uh, you know, that, that, that has increasingly been under attack. And the reason is because uh, well, the, the, the premise of the open core model is we'll have a very um, you know, powerful core, which is open source, and then we'll put value on enterprise features in a constellation around it, where we can give startups and people that just want to play around the, all the power of the open source, and they can right. make huge amounts of progress right. there. Uh, a bigger company that wants to um, use that open source is going to want not just support and indemnification, but uh, additional features that really make sense in an enterprise environment. LDAP and yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Certain, certain integrations, yeah, absolutely. And so what, what we've seen though is that uh, the expectation was that the really big companies that own the platforms like AWS and Google and Microsoft uh, wouldn't deign to compete directly with those open core companies on their enterprise right. features. Yeah, they might provide the open, the, the core that's open source and uh, you know that's just good competition, in my opinion. That is completely allowed by open source, and I believe it was uh, very much contemplated by the companies. Which yeah. is, you know, think of if you're Elastic, you might say, okay, well, uh, Amazon can compete with us because they're just going to use our core, and we can get the, the the big enterprises that are moving onto the cloud because we have all these offerings that you really do need as a big company. Um, Amazon can keep selling just the core; we can outcompete them. Right. Uh, what Amazon has, has, or AWS has done more recently is they said, you know, those enterprise features that you were holding in reserve, we're going to re-implement them ourselves. Right. Uh, or, and we'll make those open source in a different forked, uh, you know, uh, version of the core. Yeah, exactly. We're seeing it all over the place. Lots of different projects. Yeah. And there's nothing 
wrong with that. No. There's no right or wrong in this, and it's perfectly legal according to the licenses. And it makes sense from Amazon's uh, values perspective, which I is, think, come on, sorry. is just obsessed about the customer, yeah, right? Exactly. It's like, can they provide a cheaper uh, alternative that's just as good as what Elastic's providing? Yeah, they yeah. can take the core and they can re-implement these things, and then they can provide something that is gonna you know, be a cheaper alternative for their customers. Totally makes sense, yeah. right? But it also puts a huge amount of pressure on a company like Elastic or a company like Cockroach Labs uh, that's depending on that model uh, not being competed with on enterprise features. And that's sort of, that was baked into how you approach the model. And, and the problem is, of course, that Amazon has an incredible platform of, from which to compete. Yeah, exactly. Right? They have the, uh, you know, kind of like Microsoft Windows and how Microsoft was able to use that platform to their advantage to beat WordPerfect, as an example, right. with, with Microsoft Word, which was by most accounts an inferior product. Um, but because of their platform advantage, they were able to make it ubiquitous right. and, and fundamentally to drive WordPerfect on business. And I always say that, I mean, the platform point of view for them is they've made it really easy to adopt software. Like really, really simple, right? I mean, it's a, it's a few clicks and you're there. Okay, there's probably a complicated pricing model, but you know what I mean? It's, it's, it's a, I think that's what they've done. And I think we've realized ourselves, like actually building something, building a database is one thing, building something as a service is a wholly other function. Right. And that's, I think you, you have to build that, that muscle as well. Right. And I think, I think they've done a good oh, job. Very good right? Yeah. I yeah. Mean, AWS is definitely the world leader in, yeah. in services and certainly databases as a service. Uh, yeah. They have uh, more customers, uh, database customers than any other company in the sure. world, including Oracle. They don't make as much revenue as Oracle does on it, at least not yet. Volume. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, volume. Yeah. In terms of just, you know, sheer logo count, they, right. they, they're, I think, well in the lead. And that's, that's incredibly impressive. I don't think anyone does services as well as Amazon does. Yeah. Um, you know, but what does that mean for a company like Cockroach exactly. Labs? And we, we would like to continue uh, to be in business that we continue to, to make this database uh, you know, as, as live up to its potential. Yeah. So that's where we, we brought in the BSL. And the way the BSL works is business source license. It was originally created by MariaDB. Mm -hmm. And it has two components to it. Uh, one is a a period of exclusion, and the other one is uh, the sort of items that are being excluded, exclusionary clause. So what that means is the right way to think of it is for some period, you're gonna protect your, in our case, our core database right. product. It's kind of like a patent protection. We set that term at three years. Yep. It's kind of enough in software that's moving very quickly that it's a pretty big disadvantage to use a version from three years ago, yeah. for example, versus the most recent one. Uh, and then what is it, what do we protect in those three years? That's the other piece of this. And for our case, it's, it's very little that we protect, right? Like our BSL has only one exclusion, which is that you can't run the core uh, piece of uh, the core database as a service for external right. users. So it's really, uh, you know, it's, it's preserving for us one bit of um, exclusionary competitive usage. Um, one way to think of it, um, it's a little inflammatory, but uh, I think it does make sense. It's kind of like the anti-AWS clause. It's the AWS exclusionary clause because most people aren't going to, uh, you know, uh, contemplate taking uh, something like Cockroach and creating right. their own RDS for it. Um, but obviously, it's a it's a huge risk when you look at Amazon's past behavior. Right. So what happens after that three years is that the software becomes Apache licensed. So right. if we released a version. Uh, you know, this month, then in February of 2023, that version would become Apache. So, right. you know, we can see what happens is there's this legacy of open source, pure open source that's left. In the meantime, what's BSL and protected for those three years is, is uh, not strictly open source, but it's exactly the same with one exclusion. Right. And that one exclusion is that you can't compete by creating as a service. I, it's worth pointing out that you could take that core you could make it shrink wrap software, yeah. you can provide support for it, you can resell it. It's essentially equivalent. You can still fork this code, you can debug it, you can make changes to it and submit those back. Uh, you, you can do all those things, you simply can't for three years use that piece of software to create um, a competing software, a database as a service. And that's, that, it's really important to call it that. Like that's the one exclusion. Everything else about open source in terms of you can inspect the code, you have availability, you can go look at our repo today and look at all the incredible stuff that the team has built. Um, right. our the, the idea is being free. Exactly. That part of open right. source is, is, uh, right. is, is preserved and it is important 
when people think of the term open source to realize that it's, it's a completion of many different uh, it is. desirable properties. <clears throat> and, and if when you break those desirable properties down and enumerate them, you realize, hmm, well, actually there's, there's, there are distinct versions of what a lot of people might consider to still be open source that wouldn't be strictly open source according to like the OSI definition. Right. And that's okay too. Like, like community is a big piece of that. The, you know, I, I, I have a lot of conversations about this with people because I believe that an, a company can be open source without even having open source software in many ways because I think it's an ethos as well, right? Like contributing back to the community. Some of the stuff like Nathan and the team have done around, or not, I'm, just, I'm totally, I, Tobias has done around you know, contributing back to etcd mm -hmm. and this sort of stuff like giving back so that other companies that are going to use these open source projects will never run into problems and, and being, you know, being upfront and forward about that. I want to go back and, and this is kind of a good segue into the, the next section. I think, you know, we agree on open source. There's also this three year thing that we we're talking about, right? Um, in the license and, and consumption, the three years, the topic of this webinar is, you know, what's the future of data? So if we were to fast forward, right? If somebody did take our stuff and want to compete with us three years from now, let's take it, let's go to 2025. Right. Let's just push it out a little bit further. And so what do you think the future of database technology needs to be? I mean, we've come a long way with databases over Jesus since 1970, 71, I think IBM did the first, uh, whatever that thing is, uh, right. So Sabre reservation. Exactly. System. Right. Yeah, it wasn't Sabre the first use of a database, exactly. but yeah, it was definitely, we've come a long way, but I mean, I think we're going through this kind of paradigm shift right now. We talked a lot, of, a lot about stuff that like, I think broadly like this move to the cloud, just, systems in general, there's a whole new stack of stuff and the database is changing too, right? So what do you see as, you know, the, the 2025 or the 2026 data? I hate saying those words. This feels like I'm in like Star Trek or something. It's 2025, dude. So yeah, it's not, it's not that far, far away, yeah, actually. So it's going to happen before we know it. Yeah. I mean, a, a lot of it's just going to be a, a, a maturation of the trends that are already evident. In fact, have been evident since, you know, a decade ago when I was at Google, which yeah. is, you know, databases fundamentally have an opportunity to expand and to use the uh, resources that the public cloud provides. So, uh, you know, what does that mean? Well, certainly within a data center, you'd like to be able to add commodity hardware to a database sure. and it should just get bigger. It shouldn't be something where you're manually sharding and, you know, having your application direct to different databases. That's a very um, sort of primitive way to scale databases. Uh, you know, Further, you should be able to contemplate, okay, we actually can use in the public cloud multiple availability zones. Right. So let's replicate across actual data centers and that will give us less correlated failure domains. Right. So that's, that's, a, that's a way to just in, enhance resilience in, in a database. And then, you know, looking even further afield, it's this realization that latency is starting to matter more and more. And you can't go, get good latency for a user in Australia if they have to hop all the way to Virginia in order to hit the microservices, right. talk to the database, come back right. out and then go all the way back to the user in Australia. In fact, you can't do that in less than several hundred milliseconds. And that doesn't feel right if you're in It goes back to the 100 millisecond thing, right? Yeah. Right, so the 100 millisecond rule, which is pretty interesting. It was, uh, at least the first I've seen a mention of it was uh, in the Department of Defense. They did a study on command and control systems. You know, what's the, uh, maximum latency from uh, a, you know a, a user making some sort of action to when that action has an effect that's visible, right? Like hitting a key on your keyboard. Right. When should it, when should you guarantee that a letter appears on the screen? And that's a hundred milliseconds. And when you go beyond that, you've introduced a, a delay that's perceptible to a human being, Interesting. and that uh, can befuddle the experience of what should feel instantaneous and non-virtual. Right, and in these geographically dispersed systems, it's a big deal, right? Yeah, absolutely. From a database you've, point of view. You've got this speed of light problems, and it's not even the speed of light through vacuum, it's right. through lots of communication networks, sure. with uh, plenty of delays, uh, and, and uh, not a great circle around the planet either. So there's uh, significant latency right now in virtually all use cases, if you're thinking about trying to serve a, a, a global audience, right. and you've deployed your application the way virtually every application is deployed, which is in a single availability zone primarily. And so everyone's going to this one place on the planet. And that is the old model. And what really, what, what I'm expecting to happen by 2025 with databases 
and data in general and building applications is really this idea of building a global application. So what does that mean? Right, What's a global yeah. application? I think. Uh, hey, that's a great question. Yes. <laughs> What's a global application? I mean, fundamentally, you just need to look at the, <laughs> the, the companies that have built them. Yeah. Right? Google, yeah. Facebook, uh, Netflix. Netflix. Yeah. yeah, that's another big one. Um, Apple. A HBO, for that matter. I mean, they're, you know, they're streaming everywhere. Like, there's huge, massive companies doing yeah. this cool stuff. Yeah. So you know, those kinds of companies have figured out usually, and this is not an exaggeration, with engineering centuries or engineering millennia in terms of just yeah. how many actual hours engineers have spent building these kinds of data architectures. Uh, they have created what amounts to uh, global applications. And what that means, if you want to boil it down, is can your global customer base, wherever they are, have what feels like a local experience? Right. Like, are they close enough to a data center that has the uh, ability to execute their common use case in 100 milliseconds or less end to end? Right now, it's not uncommon when you're clicking on your mobile device to wait seconds, right? Right before something happens that you're you know, expecting to happen, and we're used to that. Um, but you know, I'm sure you've had this experience many times. Uh, but if you're on a train or you're walking through uh, this, a very busy street on Manhattan where sure, people yeah. probably should be paying attention, everyone is looking at their phone. Every single person. Is, is interfacing through this little screen into some kind of virtual world, whatever it is, right? It could be a productivity app, they could be on Slack, they could be- That never uh, happens to me when I'm trying to get on the subway. <laughs> never, ever, ever. <laughs> I, 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 I get bumped by a lot of people that are <laughs> deep, deep in, into deep that, in, that world, right? In mode. So that's the huge opportunity, right? Because the amount of time that an average person now spends in these virtual realities with a, a, a very, unrealistic experience between a, a, a cause like hitting a button and, and, the, and the expected effect is, is, is a huge, it's an opportunity, an unbelievable yeah. opportunity that's right for the whole next generation. I mean, people always wonder what's going to happen, what's going to be the big next platform shift, right? Because we had the iPhone and that was so obvious in hindsight. Of course, it's just going to spawn this amazing uh, re-platforming effort as everyone moves, every new use case is is reimagined for the, what this new platform feels like. And I think that, you know, people are always wondering, well, what's the next one gonna be? Is it gonna be an Apple Watch? Right. No, right? Obviously not. Um, but in hindsight, obviously, it wasn't so well. obvious. Yeah, yeah, no, you like it. But it's not, uh, I like it. it's not, the, it's not the, um, the gold rush, right? That, yeah, I mean, that I'm Dick Tracy iPhone. messages, it's cool, you know? <laughs> yeah, I, I, think, I think though that um, 5G, even though it's just another uh, increment in the number in front of the G, Right. is actually representing a potential for a new, uh, what feels like a new platform, a new gold rush. Like, can yeah. you reimagine every app? Can you reimagine Facebook for how it's going to feel or Twitter when you're able to interact with something in, in far closer to real time or in real time? So you can see what is my, what is this tweet? What is the effect of this, of this Instagram post right. in terms of like the real time, how people are interacting with it, what their reactions are. You could, you could have that same experience if you're in a crowded, room and you're the person that's speaking you're able to see all these different reactions right. right there's all these subtle clues like how is my message actually being perceived that kind of thing is going to change the uh that that sort of those subtle sort of clues can be built into these platforms right. in terms of how this next generation uh of user experience as you're interacting with your phone which is what people spend half their waking hours doing maybe more right yeah it's funny it's like we were talking about this before as well it's kind of like the last time we saw such a shift in speed was when we went from dial up to DSL. Yeah. I mean, I, I and if, if anybody was around at that time, like it was a, it was awesome. It was the most amazing thing that had ever happened. And I think the apps that came out of that were just tremendous too, right? I think that's when we started getting, you know, interactive, you know, applications that, that people actually, they became a reality. And so we're kind of going through that same thing again, right? And so you kind of went from <clears throat> the, the text-based multi-user dungeon exactly. to like, you know, Fortnite. Right. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and we're at Fortnite now. So yeah. like, there's going to be something beyond this, right? And I think right now, and at least in my opinion, 5G is a bunch of commercials from like Verizon and whoever they have the best 5G network. I don't think people realize what this means, what this the advent of. Like, like you just said, like the move, it's an incremental number, four to five seems very small, but it's, it's, it's a huge, massive it's a, leap. It's right? an incredible like, leap. Yeah, yeah it's, it's rare in telecommunication networks to have right. a, a drop in latency like the one that is, that's expected here, uh, and, and yeah. that can have 
you know, tremendous, a tremendous impact in terms of, you know, how people can reimagine what today are the, you know, multi-billion dollar, uh, you know, user platforms, like, right. you know, whatever some sort of social aspects to them or their gaming or whatever, all of those have, are, are ripe for reimagination right. in a world where 5G becomes the, the normal standard, which will happen by 2025. And so the question is, how do you make it so that the, the next, uh, you know, amazing idea for a multi-user game or AR or VR experience right. or something like that. How do you make it so those developers can build with a new ecosystem of infrastructure and um, you know, tooling, right. can build a data architecture out of the box as a startup yeah. that looks like something that Facebook has spent engineering millennia, right. building over the course of their history. You know, and obviously very painfully replatforming, and you know, it's, it's not easy to do that, right? But can can we bring that same all those ideas, boil them down into general purpose systems to enable the next generation to build things that were previously uh, difficult to conceive? So, are we going through basically a you know a massive shift in some of these? We've seen a lot of you know web scale companies come out. I remember like remember Web 2.0 came out. It was like oh, they're web scale companies. Are we going to see this like the next like 5G scale? Is that, I mean, are we looking at, are, are, is, it, is this just another, where everybody, Uber's going to get Ubered? Uh, absolutely. I mean, yeah. well, will Uber get Ubered? I mean, it's <laughs> kind of a question with Facebook at Facebook. And you, exactly. have these, uh, you have these network effects, which can be hard to overturn, certainly, yeah. but not impossible. Uh, I think, it, you know, what, what will more likely happen is it's not just going to be a, a strict reimagining of the same paradigm. But, right. a, but a, a new take on, the, yeah. on the, the old model that is sufficiently different that people are interested in it. Um, and, and, and it is very clear to me looking at some of the, the newer startups out there that are right. using Cockroach that where those startups are currently um, you know, being run by or employing ex-Google, ex-Uber, ex-Facebook engineers, right. uh, those engineers are you know, coming to the, the next project with a very different attitude yeah. than they had when they joined Google or Facebook or Uber, right? right? And, and, and when they joined those companies 10 years ago, whatever it was, uh, you know, it was a, those all were launched in a single location, right? right? And then successively and iteratively were expanded to become the global applications they are today. Right. Now, when these engineers are starting their next projects, they're saying, okay, we want to obviously build for this global audience. Like, why would we build for something that's only going to work well on the East Coast of the United States? Right. We, we fundamentally realize that our ambitions uh, include users in Brazil yeah. and users in Turkey and it's users. Global. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So we are not going to start with something that's just going to have to be replatformed again and again and again to get us to where we were, uh, you know, where we, where, where we saw yeah. Uber go, for example. Yeah, I think it's a it's a it's a really good point to wrap. It's kind of like look at those engineers have been through the paradigm shift. They get it. They understand the the, the distributed systems and what's that mean what that means. And if you wrap it back, it's, I want to ask you a question. What's a global application a little bit? Because like, I think global means scale. And I think it's, we started with we started this conversation talking about Google and the scale. But I think you know it's it's scale. It's resilience. It's 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 being able to give a, a, an experience to people no matter where they're at addressing that latency thing, right? And so I think that's where we're at today with Cockroach, with, with Cockroach DB and Cockroach Cloud, and people can do this. What, what do you see the role of Cockroach, you know, over the next, you know, for, the, develop change. yeah, for, the, for the developer, you know, over the next like three years? Because I think, you know, we've created something that I think is pretty easy to get going with, you know? Um, it is. To, to get up and running with Cockroach Cloud. So what do you, what do you, you know, like- Primarily we created something that was easy to get going with uh, if you wanted to run the database yourself. Exactly, yeah. And that's had a lot of great knock-on effects for us. It's very easy to deploy Cockroach in lots of different environments. And right. But, you know, to our earlier conversation, it seems that the future is going to be won by services. And so obviously we've been building Cockroach Cloud for the last right. year, which, uh, you know, significantly addresses this. But there's- an opportunity to really push the consumption model of how users use relational databases. Right. And it's gonna go hand in hand with how do we make it so that the next uh, you know, cohort of you know, amazing companies that come out of startups, you know, how are they able to 
efficiently use this new infrastructure like CockroachDB in order to build the next generation of uh, applications and services. Right. And the, you know, this sort of also ties together our conversation about open source, so that you can see exactly. all these things are converging. It, it all comes together. Like, what does open source mean for yeah. us in the, in, 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 by 2025? I mean, to my mind, it's obviously the source is available because you want those ideas yeah, yeah, to be yeah. there. You want people to be able to debug and to augment the, the code as it exists. Um, you want to have community for obvious reasons, and that's not something that has to be lost here. Consumption is the big one that's changing. Yeah. Right? It went from downloading the source and compiling yourself to downloading the packages and the binaries to uh, you know, now just consuming the products of the open source as a service. It's just that much faster. What's kind of missing is that fourth C, right? You have uh, code, community, consumption, and cost. Because right now, in order to have the consumption model of the online service or the cloud service, you always pay for it, right? Well, not always, but an in infrastructure, virtually always, yes. right? And that's what I would like to see change. Uh, the, the reality is that that should be free as well. You should be able to, Interesting. You should be able to consume a relational database as a developer, perpetually for free uh, as a service. And that's really going to restore the balance to open source. Because if you think about what Amazon's been doing, they've been taking open source and they've been uh, monetizing it for everybody, right? Because nobody wants to run these things themselves anymore if you kind of look at the horizon. And as Amazon's saying, well, you know, we'll close source things, no problem. If we have to build it ourselves, we're definitely not gonna open source it. So why would we waste our time doing that, right? Um, but we're gonna take this open source, we're gonna, we're gonna augment it a little bit, integrate it and provide it as a service and we're gonna charge you for it's it. Awesome. We're gonna charge everyone for it because we can, right? Well, that's, that's what needs to be disrupted right now, yep. which is that uh, you know, we, we want to you know, have things that really are available, all the source code, all the ideas, and to have the new consumption model of being able to run it as a service in the cloud without having to understand what day two operations look like ever, right? And, uh, and, and, but also making that free, perpetually free. So every hobby project, right? Every uh, hackathon, every bit of academic coursework, you should never have to think, okay, I'm gonna, if I wanna run this little thing and keep it running, I have to pay $50 a month to RDS. Right. right? No, this should just be free. There's no reason that it shouldn't be, and it can be. So going um, back to the free, free beer, free beer, yeah. right? Like go and get the software. See, people underestimate because it's always like, oh, there's yeah, free like, beer and then there's the free ideas. But well, there's free, free puppy too, remember? Yeah. Well, free and beer. And there's the consumption thing, right? And yeah. so like, this is basically bringing those two things. Like it's like you, you can bring software to people and give it for free yet still allow them to consume it as a service is what you're saying, right? Yeah. And that's also a, a certain amount of freedom, right? It frees you from the yoke of having to, uh, you know, really understand how the software operates and what right. its failure modes are and to monitor it, you yep. to alert on it and so forth and to own the pager for it, right? right. Which is incredibly expensive. Right. So, you know, the, the, the free puppy parts. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that, that consumption model is a certain amount of freedom. All of it is about freedom yeah. to a certain extent. Yeah. But the, the free beer, never underestimate how important that is to a developer. I don't. I, 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 I don't like 30 day teasers. No. I, I want something, you know, it, I think the analogy that uh, resonates best with me is what did email look like in 2003? Mm -hmm. Hotmail and Yahoo Mail and AOL Mail. Do people really use those anymore? Uh, well, my, maybe your mom. There's some people <laughs> in my family that I just let them watch it and they're gonna laugh, but yeah. Well, those There's a couple know. Yahoo users out there. Yeah, you know. there are a few uh, still. But you know, Gmail <laughs> did, did really uh, flip things on their head, which is, okay, this email is actually expensive if you want to have more than five megabytes in your mail spool if you're using a, a web email address. Right. And Gmail's like, you get a gigabyte, and it's free. always going to be free. Most people don't always for their yeah. Gmail. I do right now because I just have such a ridiculous amount of junk in there. But yeah. um, you know, it's not very much. Uh, and and that, that is something that is possible across the board, right? With even yeah. things like a very heavyweight piece of infrastructure which is the relational database. Yeah, providing transactions, which is the mission critical systems behind yeah. lots of stuff. So cool. Well, thank you, Spencer. Um, did you enjoy this? Our, our ferns are still alive. We haven't out talked anything. So <laughs> we could, though, I think. I think so. So um, cool. Well, thank you very much. Uh, that was fantastic. Thank you, everybody, for, for joining us. Um, again, the recording will be made available. We'll send it out to everybody. We'll post it on our website and everything. So um, thanks for joining us. Um, there is a survey that I believe should pop up when the webinar is over. If you could, just could please take that. This is a new um, kind of form for us to do this. So 
uh, the feedback would be really, really fantastic to make sure this is right or not. So um, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Spencer. You're welcome. Right. It's great to join. All right. And have a great day, everybody.